is on. of the metrics that go to make up that income category or how many people in an area are on different types of benefits. Uh, and that doesn't mean to say that's not an entirely valid metric, but I think um, given what we've talked about on um, cost of living crisis and things like that, what um, the, some of the challenges we are seeing are not related to potentially long-term uh, financial vulnerability. They are sort of new and emerging um, situations of financial vulnerability where potentially um, sudden and dramatic range changes in energy bills have left someone in a, uh, or households in a financial problems. Um, I'm seeing Ross there with his pen in his hands and I'm wondering if I've touched a nerve, but I don't know, he can come and kick me afterwards. Um, and so, uh, so that kind of uh, situation means that maybe we, we shouldn't just be focusing on benefits. Uh, so I guess what I want to talk about, and I'm kind of getting there just about, is how do we supplement or enhance uh, the index of multiple deprivation? Uh, and I suppose what I would um, think about as desires for this would be, it should be near real time. Like it should allow, say, a local authority or you know, sort of policy or intervention kinds of decisions based on data that is as close to real time as possible. Uh, it should link into uh, administrative spatial resolution, so uh, data zones in Scotland or LSOA type things in uh, England and Wales, uh, and it should help us see these evolving situations. So things like the cost of living crisis where you would take a um, potentially a traditionally wealthy neighbourhood who have bought houses with period features and discovered that their energy bills have suddenly become um, really brutally high. Uh, and that's not going to be something that would capture in, say, you know, counts of benefits um, as, you know, it's not a sort of an area of traditional financial vulnerability. Uh, so how can we, and this is we as uh, a smart data foundry, um, help in this situation? Um, so I think we can only offer part of the solution. Uh, so we work with um, people like NatWest Group. Uh, and um, EPCC, uh, which is the Edinburgh Parallel Computing Center. And we um, help or we host curate um, financial data uh, from people like NatWest in order for people to access it for sort of research or for um, public sector type insight things. Um, we operate on a five safe principles uh, and we use the same infrastructure that um, things like uh, the NHS use for patient records um, and the same controls and governance structures that are around that in terms of who can access it and what for and all those other things. Um, and uh, so that national safe haven infrastructure also comes along with information governance. And I'm saying these things because often when, I suppose, when we as an organization give these talks, it's frequent for someone to come at the end and say, I'm an Atwest customer, I didn't know my data was doing this. Um, so there are all sorts of controls and anonymizations in place that makes it extremely, extremely difficult, if not impossible, for us to actually identify people. So it's about how do we do this kind of work safely. Um, so what does this mean in practice? Uh, toy data, definitely not real data. So this is the kind of stuff we get from NatWest. Uh, we get a anonymized ID, uh, we get sex information, it's just male and female. Uh, we get um, data aggregated on a weekly basis. Uh, and then we get a breakdown of sort of income categories. We get a breakdown of expenditure categories. These are the ones that the bank has to report to the Financial Conduct Authority. Uh, and then we get some things around um, cash balance um, at the kinds of beginnings and ends of periods and that sort of thing. Um, we are working with NatWest to get uh, sort of different levels of categorization, but this is currently effectively where we stand. Uh, and so what we then do is we use this safe haven infrastructure uh, to transform this data about individuals to statistics about an area or a group. So taking that personally identify or potentially personally identifiable information and saying, well, in this area, overdraft use might be 20% or in this area or in this group of you know, pensioners, we're uh, seeing the spend on energy bills at this kind of level. Uh, I keep expecting the arrow keys to move me on, but we'll get there. Um, so some of the sample metrics, have we lost the screen? Oh, no, we're back. Fantastic. So some of the sample metrics that we've been looking at are things around benefits dependence. So this uh, relates quite closely to the things we've seen on the SIMD. Um, some things on overdraft use, um, 
I, I mean, I don't know. I have opinions on overdraft use, but it's actually it does seem to work quite well. Uh, and also some things on income. So like rather than um, purely say relating things to uh, deprivation or benefits is going, well, actually, what is the average income within this area? And we can use those kinds of things for potentially around workforce planning. So saying if you are um, if you are a large employer and you want to recruit people uh, within a given salary band, where do you target, uh, say, you know, letter drops or um, mailing campaigns or that sort of thing in order to, to have those recruitment policies? So that could be important, say, for the care sector or maybe things like airports or uh, organizations like that. Um, so we've got some caveats. Uh, what you're going to see is entirely work in progress. Uh, think of this as market testing or sneak peek. It depends. I don't know. I don't mind. Uh, there are some smallish sample sizes, uh, which possibly um, Anna might want to ask me about later on. Um, as there's, I've got some other information on sort of the missingness around this data. Uh, and what I've done here is some really quite crude spatial joins between postcode district and um, uh, between data zone. Uh, which we are working with NatWest to improve, but for the time being and for this, um, there are some fairly crude spatial joins uh, and some aggregations going on behind that. So don't take any of this as sort of absolute values. Uh, so first plot, um, the index of multiple, or the SIMD uh, compared to benefits dependent by postcode district. So each one of the dots is a postcode di district in Scotland. There's about 400 of them. Um, and this is for, where are we now, August? Uh, I think this is for the last week in July. Uh, so it is the uh, percentage of people, or our data are the percentage of people within a postcode district who have uh, who rely on benefits for 60% or more of their income. Uh, and then on the x-axis, we've got uh, the index of multiple deprivation income group. So we can see, uh, and the line is a one-to-one -one relationship. Um, there's actually surprisingly quite a good relationship there, considering that, like I say, there are some caveats. We've obviously got some missing data down here where we've got a whole lot of zeros going on. This is probably due to some relatively small sample sizes. I say relatively small. We've got um, 1.2 million customers' records for GB, which translates to a bit over 100,000 for Scotland, um, but when we start breaking them down to you know, sort of postcode district or sort of age band or income band, um, it, it does make for some quite small um, data sizes. Um, clearly not a map, and we're here for spatial stuff, so I should probably talk about that a bit. Uh, we've had two talks on R already. Um, for those of you who are eagle-eyed enough, I'm using R for all of my plotting, and I will have a quick couple of lines of code uh, at the end of the talk to uh, to show how I made uh, some of these figures. Um, but what we've got here is, is the deviation from the, um, from the index multiple deprivation um, income category to our benefits uh, dependence. So uh, where it is sort of that below zero, that is our value is slightly less than um, than the SIMD one, and where it is more than um, um, ours is sort of a higher value. Uh, so we're seeing, I guess, like lots of um, increases, but then these metrics aren't quite the same. Um, that the index of multiple deprivation is how many people have any kind of benefit that's not, say, child benefit or winter fuel, and ours is where is that high dependence for income on benefits. Uh, the gray areas are effectively missing data, i.e., uh, I suppose. If you're a banking competitor, you might be able to infer, infer some market share there about NatWest customers. Uh, however, you could probably just do that from the location of branches. Um, so the next one, uh, overdraft use. So I mentioned earlier, I have some slight caveats around this. Uh, I used to have an overdraft when I was an undergraduate. And after a few years, the bank weaned me off it by gradually reducing my overdraft value and then telling me I couldn't have it unless I paid for it, which is entirely reasonable, I suppose. Um, but what? Um, but my thought about this is that actually it's not most banks, I suspect, are like this. And when you try and go overdrawn, your, uh, your charges will be declined. So these are agreed overdrafts, I would presume. And an agreed overdraft uh, is unlikely to be given if you are... Uh, or if you have a history of financial vulnerability. So likely, this is not that traditional group of benefits claimants. This is people who 
have potentially been wealthy enough that the bank's happy to lend them money on a you know some kind of fun interest overdraft rate because they're expecting to get it back because they know that they're getting that income so these are i guess potentially some quite different um indicators here uh, and again in, in map form um so we're showing basically much higher overdraft use than for most of these areas than we would see in, in sort of benefits uh i'm again like i mean this is super early work it's interesting that sort of the upper d around about braemar is really high uh i mean it's i don't know um could that be something to do with it being a long way off the gas grid and you know it being expensive to heat properties up there um it's often sort of braemar is one of the coldest places in scotland uh it's not unusual for hit to hit minus 20. um a lot of these are quite rural areas so it's yeah um, there's some potentially interesting things around sort of transport poverty or fuel poverty uh, within that. Uh, and the last one of these is um, comparing to income. Um, now, I don't have a map for this one for hopefully some relatively obvious reasons that trying to compare um, financial values against percentages is not sensible in terms of subtracting one from the other. Um, but what we've got here again is that each dot here is a uh, postcode district. And we can see that for the really high levels of um, SIMD income deprivation, uh, they were also getting low income levels. But we've also got uh, over on the left side of the graph, we've got some of the lowest income groups uh, that don't have a high level of, um, of SIMD um, income deprivation. And, and I you know, I don't know, there's possibly lots of things that are going on there. Maybe it's just a low wage area. Maybe it's not sort of high, uh, high cost areas. Maybe it's like an older population where they, you know, pensions are lower, but they don't have particularly high outgoings. I suppose there's all sorts of things um, going on in that space. Uh, how are we doing for time? I'm not going to talk about averages, but clearly like these are a long way above where we might expect income figures to be and that's to do with sort of means uh, and high earners pulling up those means rather than necessarily relating to the general or the most general population uh, so the other cool thing we can do with this data is that we have this on a weekly basis so rather than say like in map form where we might just show things statically uh, we can show this as a time series uh, and i've talked for a long time so i thought i'd do this like a quiz uh, we've got here, every one of these lines is a different um, postcode district in Scotland. Uh, so where it is darker, there are more and more of them overlapping. Uh, so we are here in the G12 postcode. Where do we think uh, the G12 postcode sits on this benefits dependence in Scotland? Um, so I guess like hands up for really low. Hands up for somewhere in the middle. Uh, hands up for somewhere high. Okay, let's have a look. Um, so yeah, it's really low. Uh, we kind of, I suppose we might expect that. It's a, one would expect like a relatively nice area of Glasgow. Oh, it's not Edinburgh. But, um, it's, and, um, and so that's kind of reflected in this, this sort of benefits dependence. Uh, the same thing again for overdraft use. Uh, where do we think that um, I'm kind of ignoring all the stuff above 25% because that's you know, mainly just outliers and small sample sizes. So within that kind of black band, where are we expecting G12 to sit? Uh, so low, no one, middle, okay, uh, high, a couple of highs. Um, so it's quite low. Um, Interesting note, so between 2021 and 2022, uh, we do have data going further back than this, um, sort of pre-pandemic, but one of the things we found, um, and I know we're all trying to blot out COVID, but hey um, is that when uh, the first lockdowns hit, a lot of people's incomes dropped, but actually their expenditure dropped, or average expenditure dropped much faster than average income. So things like overdraft fell away um, quite sharply in everything but like the lowest income groups where it actually just tended to sit quite static and uh, hopefully for fairly obvious reasons that if you're already on the bread line then you you know expenditure doesn't really drop um so i think that's what we're seeing there between 2021 and 2022 is there were lockdowns during that period and so expenditure dropped and um and that reduced um people's use of overdraft and then as we saw opening up through 2022 and 2023 uh, then we're starting to see that um increase in in overdraft again um, it's relatively low, but I suppose as yeah, possibly as the student population has arrived back and things like that, we're seeing 
um, some of those overdraft values creep up. Uh, and finally, uh, income in the G12 postcode, uh, low, middle, high. Um, I was kind of surprised it was as high as it was actually. Uh, but so yeah, we can see uh, um, similar to the last plot, there's that dropping drop in income through 2021. Uh, as you know, lockdowns happened and uh, people were working less and all those other things. Um, so some of the use cases around this, how am I doing for time? Five minutes, that's okay. Um, so we've been working with East Rome Future Council uh, just to the south of Glasgow uh, and got a little screenshot of uh, the dashboard that we've built with some of this data for them. Uh, we've brought in a lot of contextual data sort of around um, some of their policy drivers on child poverty and uh, fuel um, sort of home efficiency type things. So they, they can compare uh, stuff like overdraft use or energy spend uh, to things like how many properties have got poor energy efficiency, those kinds of questions. Um, we think this kind of stuff would be really useful for interventions and baselines. So say you are a uh, local authority and you're thinking of adding a new bus route uh, and you could say, well, what's the income in an area beforehand? I've added a bus route, what's the income afterwards? Has it enabled people to go to um, and get different jobs or more jobs than they would have done beforehand? Like what's the, what's the cost benefit on that sort of society piece in terms of the, like the financial well-being of, of the groups in there? Um, I think it's kind of like a canary in the coal mine. Uh, like I say, I mean, we, I think we all have uh, personal knowledge of where the areas in financial difficulty are near where we live. But what's I think really useful here is that we can start to see financial difficulty before it's necessarily manifest um, sort of visibly, that you can see people starting to go into their overdrafts or where their you know, disposable income has fallen below certain amounts. Uh, and this can obviously like, help drive planning and policy changes and all of those in sort of local and national governments. Um, uh, so future development stuff, uh, we are super keen to start doing this in England and Wales. Um, we've got some other metrics we are beginning to work on around net zero homes. Um, so you know, those who are most vulnerable, like how do you do a just transition uh, and um, target support in those areas which need the energy performance the most, but also can least afford to make the change. Uh, things on public health and, and child poverty as well. Um, and then very quickly, can I do two minutes on maps with R? Yeah. Uh, so why? Uh, I mean, like I, you know, I work with R a lot. Uh, actually, quite sadly, I don't actually have QGIS installed on my uh, laptop or Grass, which is like, I don't know, the first time in years and years. Um, but maybe it's just a sign that I make less maps than I used to. Uh, it's, I love the scalability. I can write code once and then reuse it many, many times. Um, when do I do it? I tend to do it when it's uh, really quite straightforward. Um, plots. So instead of it being cartography, uh, more just like a spatial visualization rather than I am making a map about an area. Uh, and is it easy? Um, I mean, I think so, but I guess you'd be the judge. Uh, so the uh, geocomputation website has got loads of great resources in R and Python, and often like in little toggle switches that you click on the switch, you see the code in R, click on the switch, and it shows you the code in Python to generate the same output. Uh, I've used ggplot, uh, which is an R package for the, the figures you've seen here. Um, and if you can't see this at the back, because I can't, uh, so I made it bigger. And in order to, uh, to make that, that figure that I had just there uh, of Scotland and each of the postcode districts, uh, this is effectively what I did. Uh, so I loaded the tidyverse and the SF packages. I uh, loaded the geo package because uh, no one uses shape. And um, so I checked the ST layers to see what uh, layers I'd put in this geo package some years ago. And uh, it's got one on postcode district and one on postcode area. Uh, so I read that in and then I plotted that and I added uh, the SF. Like that was, that's everything that makes the plot here. Oh, um, that one. Um, and then, you know, you can do colors and all those other fancy things, but that's effectively it. Uh, so as a quick summary, uh, R is great for data visualization maps. Uh, finance data can supplement statistics. Um, for us uh, and our data partners, privacy and trust are key. Uh, and we are super welcoming for collaborators and use cases. Uh, thank you.
think we do have some time for some, yeah, why not? Yeah, we have some time for questions if you. Is it about this? What system? Uh, so just turn on the mic so people can hear. Oh, okay. Well, that's very fancy. I was going to talk about, I, I just had a sort of a question about the time series stuff. Is there, um, is that also part of the visualization outputs as well, rather than bar graphs? And is there any plans to use potential predictive analysis to kind of get into the future? <laughs> Um, so, I mean, it's super small for a number of reasons, um, but so this, this dashboard view uh, is based on the dash from SuperZip example that's on the Shiny Gallery deposit, if you're interested in having a look, but I see uh, the two plots up there on the right, uh, so the top one is a time series of everything that's visible, so as a local authority zooms around the map, um, it displays sort of the data in view as a time series of that period. So, so yes, it's, that's kind of what it's We do a second part as well. Is that probably more about if there was any plans in now or in the future in terms of using that data set with predictive stuff? Um, so, kind of my view on this, and I think um, the same view with AI as well, is uh, that, that this stuff is certainly uh, um, so public sector or decision making use and so many for research that, that like, there are so many things you can do with it that it doesn't involve really chunky guesswork um, like AI or sort of what you're doing. So now it doesn't change the predictive piece. I think it would be interesting and useful. But I guess like the, the idea around this is like we are able to see uh, from I guess like current account use things that we wouldn't expect to see. Uh, so uh, I think it's a pointy stick, probably. I mean, maybe this is this word. Um, so over the sort of the yellowy, oh, hang on, I've got that a second. Yeah, if you go to bed earlier, that's the problem. So this area here is uh, is Barhead, and it's um, sort of had long-standing traditional policy. So no one is surprised that it is forced by highly programmed use and lots of those other things. Um, whereas over here, um, is sort of the edge of nether lee and um it also scores quite high for overdraft use and the local party were really surprised about this uh, now there may be some data resolution issues but quite possibly one of the things we were asked to look at was about people moving into East Renfrewshire for school access and did that mean they had over mortgaged themselves and suddenly found themselves in um, and particularly in homes with poor energy performance so this this area of um, high overdraft use also coincides with areas with um, really poor energy performance. So, you know, if you mortgage yourself up to the hilt in order to get your kid into a better school, and then you've discovered that, you know, that lovely fireplace and high ceilings and cornices uh, actually just leaks heat, you know, it's, yeah, you potentially find yourself in a really weird situation. And yes, we can, I suppose we can diagnose that afterwards, but my, I suppose my worry about the predictive piece is we can only predict based on our own biases and assumptions, not necessarily based on something that we wouldn't have seen, say, 10 years ago. So I have like two questions, mainly regarding the pipeline process. Do you do one at a time, so I've got a really short memory. <laughs> Take one. So um, regarding getting your data, I know, that, I know that you said you use sample data from NetWorks Group. What's the process look like obtaining that data? Is there a portal that you go on and you put a request in? Or it's an extremely lengthy. Um, so, and I think this is, uh, so while like Rosie and I are in a data science team, um, I think the, the biggest value Smart Data Foundry has as an organization is the relationship building with the financial institutions. Um, so even, even with existing data sharing agreements, it can take us a year to get new categories of data. Uh, the initial setup stuff to get <coughs> the basic categories took maybe 18 months, two years. Um, like it's, it's really, really long um, driving that through all of the kind of decision points within the bank around like what they want to do for the corporate responsibility, what they want to do in terms of maintaining privacy, how we safeguard that and make sure all of those things are okay. And these are, I guess, like right at the moment we are under, or we're in really 
tightly defined data sharing agreements. So we're allowed to use um, NatWest data for the cost of living crisis, uh, which you know, obviously makes total sense. But if, say, someone wanted to come to us with a gambling question, um, which you know, so there is a lot of interest in that, but we then need to go back and have host those talks or mediate those talks um, with uh, not, I suppose, not just NatWest, but you know, other banks and um, accounting firms and things as well that we we work with. But yeah, it's it's really long. And it's uh, and we've got a a very strong uh, information governance team who help us with all of that. And then the next question is bringing your insight to the market to the council. How quickly do they get that data and go actionable with it? Do they take a year as well, or do they take a couple of, or do they work on to their own schedules? So, um, so for East Ramfusha, we host a dashboard for them and um, careful exactly what I say as I'm not quite sure what the contract is at the moment. Um, we can, we get new data from NatWest ish every week. I mean, like I say, sometimes they send it every fortnight, but we get weekly data generally once a week. Sometimes people are on holiday and maybe we get an update once a month. But we'll get all weeks of data for that one. Um, so we like we're, we're really reluctant to commit contractually to weekly updates um, for you know for a uh, for a local authority because we can't guarantee we're going to get that from that once. But uh, quarterly is like, absolutely achievable. But it could you know, it could be more frequent than that. Okay. Oh, let you, yeah, pointing at people. Maybe if you yeah. can do it, if it's a quick one, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, the, I guess looking at moving statistics to like faster updates, which is the point of this, right? And then, um, what What's the previous kind of, it was like last year's tax returns from HMRC kind of data, like? Yeah, so uh, we call it the Department of Working Pensions, uh, basically, the UWP would send data on benefits claims um, in these small outlier or yeah actually probably small outlier areas that are aggregated up. Uh, so yes that could be 